It's been long understood that there are only so many ways molecules can crystallize together. Because molecular bonds form at specific angles, they need to be in specific shapes in order to fit together without any gaps in between. The situation is very analogous to covering a flat surface with tiles. It's easy to do with squares or hexagons, but if you're only given regular pentagons, you'll never be able to cover an entire surface without gaps. So when Dan Shetman claimed to have evidence of solid crystallized structures formed by pentagons, he was mocked and ostracized from the scientific community. They rejected his evidence for his quasi-crystal. This five-fold symmetry was explicitly forbidden by the current understanding of chemistry. Linus Pauling, the winner of the Nobel Prize in both chemistry and peace, publicly stated, There are no such thing as quasi-crystals, only quasi-scientists. However, almost 30 years later, Dan Schreitman himself would win the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 2011 for the discovery of the real phenomenon of quasi-crystals. So, what are quasi-crystals, and what might we learn from them? Well, let's go back to our example of covering a surface with tiles. In 1961, scientists determined that one can create a tile set that could cover a plane completely, but unlike square or hexagon tiles, would do so without a repeating pattern, aperiodically. The first such tile set was thousands of tiles long, and it was unclear what a minimal tile set might look like. In 1972, Sir Roger Penrose discovered a tile set that, when assembled, looked something like this. Using only two different types of tiles, this design does have this forbidden five-fold symmetry. If you look closely, however, what seems to be a repeating pattern in each slice of the diagram is not actually repeating. Each star has different neighbors as you work your way out from the center. Moreover, it's impossible to predict what the next layer will be. There are nearly infinite possibilities the further you get out, but they will all look similar. It's this same type of symmetry that the quasi-crystals that Dan Schreitman discovered exhibit. The ability for molecules to do this is incredibly exciting. The differences between the graphite in your pencil and the diamond in a wedding ring are due to the different molecular crystal structures of carbon. A quasi-crystal arrangement of molecules allows for a potentially infinite new types of materials, some potentially having exotic and useful properties. This is not what the video is about, however. What I find most interesting about quasi-crystals is that they may be able to definitively prove that supposed UFO fragments really are extraterrestrial in origin, or at least were created with technology we don't yet understand. While we can currently create quasi-crystals in controlled laboratory conditions, the exact quasi-crystal structure is indeterminate. Due to the infinite possibilities that can be arranged, no two will be identical. Unless it was manufactured with an advanced nanotechnology. If you took a look at samples from a quasi-crystal coating on an object, and it turned out all the samples had the exact same internal quasi-crystal structure, you'd know that something unnatural was going on. Moreover, if you found a quasi-crystal you thought was from an alien civilization, who knows what could be encoded in its molecular structure? The self-similar but aperiodic structure of quasi-crystals borders the line between structure and chaos. One can see this same concept of similar structures repeating but not repeating exactly when looking at the words on a page or neurons in a brain. If an alien civilization had the ability to control a quasi-crystal's growth on a nano level, they could easily encode the wealth of all their civilization's knowledge into a near indestructible quasi-crystal the size of a grain of sand. Perhaps a dying civilization might send billions of these seeds out across the universe 
in a last-ditch effort to say, we were here. And we may have found such a message. Paul Steinhardt had been studying the possibilities of quasi-crystals around the same time Dan Schreppmann discovered the first man-made sample in the 80s. Since then, Steinhardt had been determined to find a natural quasi-crystal. Most scientists agree that quasi-crystals would never form in nature. Given the tiles used in this Penrose tiling example, it would be much, much easier to just put the shapes in a organized repeating pattern. Nature, similarly, would surely form the less complex periodic molecular structures if given the chance. Steinhardt, however, stubbornly continued his search for over 20 years, going to museum after museum, university collection after collection, searching for a natural quasi-crystal. His search involved shining photons through the material and observing the resultant pattern. The interference pattern of the photons going through the regular structure shows the symmetry present in the material. Eventually, Steinhardt found something that looked somewhat like this. He had found a naturally occurring material with the supposed forbidden five-fold symmetry. He then spent the next 10 years of his career tracing the history of this natural quasi-crystal. He found the man who originally plucked it out of the clay around the Koryak Mountains of Russia, and he went there himself, where he successfully searched for and recovered more samples. After careful examination of the original and new samples, Steinhardt came to the shocking conclusion. These natural quasi-crystals were extraterrestrial in origin. Yes, the only natural instance of quasi-crystals ever found came from outer space. The grains of quasi-crystals were determined to be embedded in this meteorite that formed 4 billion years ago, and it struck in Russia nearly 15,000 years ago. Unfortunately though, in a sad twist of fate, we may never know the whole story of these alien quasi-crystals. Most of the samples were ground up for analysis. This showed their perfect quasi-crystal structure, more perfect than any man-made quasi-crystal, but it would have scrambled any larger message that the crystal may have contained. The two remaining intact samples were shipped express mail to a facility where an X-ray molecular mapping would take place. Unfortunately, these samples never arrived at the facility. Be it common negligence or contrived conspiracy, the true nature of these alien quasi-crystals may have been lost to history. And as much as that frustrates you and I, it frustrated Steinhardt even more. He wrote a book about his hunt for the natural quasi-crystal, the second kind of impossible, the extraordinary quest for a new form of matter. Reading it, you get the sense that Steinhardt may in fact think that he's discovered a piece of an alien spacecraft in this meteorite. He dares not explicitly state this, though, given how reluctant the scientific community is to even accepting the idea of quasi-crystals. The meteorite that Steinhardt discovered wasn't interesting just for the quasi-crystals within it either. It also contained metallic aluminum, something not found in any other meteorite and something also thought impossible. Especially with the intact samples lost, it is impossible to tell if the quasi-crystals were intelligently made or if the metallic aluminum was part of alien technology, as the impact with Earth surely destroyed any coherent structure of the aluminum. That said, is there any way to tell what the meteorite might have looked like before it struck Earth? It turns out, yes. Based on the internal structure of the meteorite and the isotopes contained within, Steinhardt was able to determine that this meteorite likely broke off of a larger asteroid several million years ago. Based on where the meteorite hit 
and the time periods inferred from the isotope decay and the geologic record, Steinhardt found what is likely the parent asteroid of this meteorite, 89 Julia. Could there be intact samples of alien technology floating in the abyss for billions of years only to end up orbiting our sun in the asteroid belt? It's very possible. Currently, the best images available of this asteroid are incredibly low resolution. Better images might show clear, unnatural structures on the surface. Eventually, we may send probes there to discover any technology buried within the surface. In the meantime, we now have one more thing to look for to validate the intelligent alien creation of any artifacts. Do any of the off-world craft or the UFO fragments that To The Stars Academy claims they have contain quasi-crystal material? If so, do they share the same internal structure? Such a match would be near irrefutable evidence of intelligent alien civilization. Unfortunately, details of the analysis done on these objects is incredibly sparse. As the mysteries of these alien quasi-crystals unravel, we continue to progress with our understanding of man-made terrestrial quasi-crystals. From cloaking devices to advanced computer components, the possibilities are quite exciting. I'll be coming to you with more, so if you found this video interesting, please subscribe to get the latest. And please like and share this video. The more people that know about quasi-crystals, the more pressure we can put on the scientific community to study and share their research. Perhaps, one day, instead of shunning people like Dan Shretman, the scientific community will be more accepting and it won't take 30 years for novel ideas to gain acceptance. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time on Rather Be Squidding.